एवरीवन आई एम प्रियंका विल्सन एंड वेलकम टू जीएस स्कोर सीरीज ऑफ डिकोडिंग द यूपीएससी सिलेबस विद मैक्रो टॉपिक डिटेलिंग दिस इज द सेकंड वीडियो इन द सीरीज ऑफ डिकोडिंग द हिस्ट्री ऑफ द सिलेबस बाय राशिद यासीन सर इन दिस सेशन ही विल बी डीलिंग विद द मेडिवल हिस्ट्री पार्ट ऑफ द हिस्ट्री ऑफ द सिलेबस विद मैक्रो टॉपिक डिटेलिंग एंड इंटीग्रेटिंग देम विद प्रीवियस ईयर क्वेश्चंस So guys stay tuned to our channel and wait for the next videos and if you like this video so please like share comment and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon for regular updates thank you Hello everyone I am Rashid and in my previous video I had discussed the syllabus of ancient India of history optional as prescribed by UPSC and today we'll discuss the syllabus as well as some important questions asked in previous years related to early medieval history and medieval indian history clear so the section b of paper 1 of history optional is related to early medieval phase early medieval phase means from 750 ad till 1200 ad and the medieval phase that starts from 1200 ad with the establishment of delhi sultanate till the end decline of the mughal empire clear so the first topic that is mentioned in early medieval india is early medieval india is about the polity that is the political situation that existed in especially in the northern part of india from 750 ad till 1200 ad clear so major political developments in north india and peninsula first of all we'll understand early medieval india basically means early medieval india basically means 750 ad to 1200 ad we'll study this phase of 750 ad to 1200 ad with respect to these major developments so first major topic prescribed by upsc is major political developments in north india and peninsula i'll let you know that during this phase from 750 ad till 1200 ad in northern india and in the region of peninsula that is upper part of the dakkan three contemporary dynasties began to rule these dynasties were the palas in the eastern india the pratiharas in western india and the rajputas in the region of dakkan or peninsula and all the three contemporary dynasties they began to fight against each other for the mastery of an important region that is kannauj clear kannauj became a focal center of power since the days of harshvardhan of ancient india in order to emerge as major power all the three powers wanted to have control over a mastery over kannauj therefore the struggle over kannauj by three major powers is termed in history as the tripartite struggle clear because three powers were involved but apart from political contest all the three dynasties that is the palas the pratiharas and the rajputas contributed significantly towards cultural growth and development palas patronized the buddhist faith at the same time pratiharas patronized the brahmanical faith and rajputas patron of well liberal enough to pat to support all religions but most of them supported jain religion at this time clear these were major developments in northern india and south india at the same time apart from this major political development another major political and cultural development during the early medieval phase was rise of rajputs clear rajputs the origin and the origin and rise of rajputs has become a fascinating topic among historians clear the different theories related to the rise of rajputs in northern india but the most acceptable theory is that four important rajput clans emerged from a fire pit and therefore they are known as the agnikul rajputs and these agnikul rajputs like pratihars parmars chalukyas and chauhans these rajputs were given the power and authority to defend northern india especially against foreign invaders coming from the north western part of india therefore rajputs defended india for a considerable period of time but due to some major defects in the inherent policies rajputs were defeated and ultimately led to gorian success and establishment of delhi sultanate in the indian territory clear apart from this during the early medieval phase very important development took place in the extreme southern part of india south of peninsula that led to the start that witnessed the establishment of an important dynasty known as 
of the cholas as you remember in the previous class of an ancient yeah, we discussed that three contemporary dynasties of cholas cheras and pandyas existed at the southern tip of indian subcontinent but at the same time they were they never played major role after the decline of indo roman trade but by 9th century cholas emerged to be a main line power in the extreme southern part of india and cholas extended its control not only over indian territory but even over the regions of sri lanka and even over some parts of bay of bengal region clear the most prominent among the cholas were the rajaraj first and his son and successor Rajendra first and both these rulers went for extensive military conquest and they even contributed to its cultural growth and development importantly they constructed large temples including the Brihadeshwara temple at Tanjore which is a very important temple constructed in the Dravid style of temple architecture this was major political and cultural developments at the same time early medieval india is also marked by a very important economic development known as the growth and development of samanta system which is also known as indian feudalism in the previous class we had discussed that seeds of indian feudalism started with land grants which was started first of all by satvahans in favor of brahmans and that was later practiced to a large extent by the gupta rulers of ancient india the practice continued even under harshvardhan and in early medieval india large number of feudal lords or samantas emerged in india and that led to decentralization of power and pockets of different authority as samantas began to rule with huge amount of autonomy with delegated authority so indian feudalism became a very important thing and you get questions on indian feudalism off and on in upsc examination the most important authority who has worked on indian feudalism is r s sharma ram sarman sharma and we'll be discussing about all the major dimensions of indian feudalism in our classes as well clear next major development was related to indian feudalism was agrarian economy because feudalism did not promote long distance internal and external trade so economy became inward looking and economy got confined to agrarian productions or agrarian development clear at the same time urban settlements continued to decline because economy became basically inward looking diverse arts and crafts could not be promoted to a large extent so urban economy started to decline and that was replaced by agrarian economy trade and commerce was there but largely trade and commerce was with internal trade only external trade could not be promoted except by the cholas the cholas promoted external trade with southeast asia also and chola rulers promoted external trade even with china through the bay of bengal region society if we look into society obviously society got crystallized into four important sections among hindus that is brahmans kshatriyas vaishyas and shudras untouchables also continued to exist in indian society within society the condition of women started to deteriorate since agriculture was basically a male dominated activity economically women became dependent on men and that is why condition of women started to deteriorate which is clearly mentioned in a contemporary work that is matsya purana matsya purana even authorizes the husband to beat his wife as well which indicate the pathetic condition of women in indian society science and technology could not develop much during early medieval phase as we had discussed contact with outside world was not as efficient as it existed earlier and therefore without contact with outside world science and technology could not be promoted to a large extent but rulers like senas especially balala sen they wrote very important work on astronomy that is adbhut sagar and these were considered to be important developments in astronomical activities these were major developments in early medieval india at the same time with respect to this topic we'll understand what kind of questions has been asked in previous years the first question that we look into describe the development of chola power under raj raj and rajendra first form an estimate of the cultural contributions very important as we had discussed cholas emerged to be main line powers in the extreme southern part of india and the dynasty even though was founded by vijayalaya but the most powerful rulers were raj raj first and his son and successor rajendra first clear raj raj first defeated the chera navy that is the navy 
corresponding with modern Kerala. Chera Navy at Trivandrum, Raj Raj first even conquered northern part of Sri Lanka and Raj Raj extended the territorial frontier. The policy was continued by Rajendra first, he conquered the whole of Sri Lanka. Rajendra first even defeated large number of contemporary powers that led to establishment of a strong and centralized Chola power. At the same time, they contributed towards cultural growth and development. Raj Raj first constructed Brihadeshwa temple devoted to the worship of Lord Shiv at Tanjore in 1010 AD. Rajendra first led the base establishment of a new city known as Gangai Konda Cholapura. And in this city, Rajendra first also constructed a Shiv temple which was also named as the Brihadeshwara temple. All these activities led to huge development in the 16th southern part of India under the Cholas especially under Raj Raj first and his son and successor. Rajendra passed. Clear. Next major question that has been asked in 2001. Did the triangular conflict between the Rajputas, Gurjara, Pratiharas and Palas create a political vacuum in northern India which facilitated the invasions of Mahmud Ghazni? As we had discussed, tripartite struggle took place over the mastery of Kannauj among the Palas, the Pratiharas and the Rajputas. And ultimately, due to their continuous conflict, all of the three dynasties exhausted their energy and came to an end. That created a kind of political vacuum in northern part of India, which largely facilitated Muhammad Ghori to enter into northern territory after defeating the Rajputs. And it cannot be denied that it facilitated to a large extent the establishment of a Sultanate or Empire with its center of power at Delhi. These were major development. These are major questions that has been asked from early medieval India, that is from 750 AD till 1200 AD. Within early medieval phase, there's another topic that is mentioned by UPSC is cultural traditions in India. What cultural developments took place from 750 AD till 1200 AD. Clear? We'll look into those developments. Cultural traditions of early medieval India. Again, just look into the period. It's again from 750 it is from 750 AD. Do remember this phase till 1200 AD. Clear? Now, in cultural traditions, the major development took place in the form of philosophy and philosophers. The most prominent being Sankarachar, who belonged to 9th century, then followed by Ramanuj, Madhavachar. What were forms of religion? Tamil devotional cult, growth of bhakti, arrival of Islam and Sufism. Clear? Shankara Char is considered to be the greatest philosopher of Indian tradition who gave the philosophy of Advaita aware by him precise that the creator of universe and the created beings are one and the same thing and in order to realize the synonymity between the creator and the created beings, he advocated the path of knowledge which is known as the Gyan Mark. However, the philosophy of Shankaracharya could not acquire huge popularity among masses and therefore the path of bhakti or devotion was advocated by another saint that is Ramanuj in the 11th century who advocated Vasist Advaitva that is qualified form of monism. After Ramanuj, another philosopher who came into being was Madhavachar who advocated Brahma Mimansa. Unlike Shankaracharya and Ramanuj, Madhavachar emphasized on hardcore hardcore religious rituals and these religious rituals were to be followed strictly as was followed during the Vedic period by the Brahmins in India. Apart from this, the forms of religion that developed in India during the Middle phase, the forms of religion were quite distinct. Apart from orthodox religions, two new concept of religion came into being known as the Bhakti and the Sufi movement. Clear? Bhakti movement was advocated by two group of saints that is Alvars and Nayanars. Alvars were worshippers of Lord Vishnu. Nayanars were worshippers of Lord Shiv. And both of them showed complete devotion, pure devotion towards God without any strict rituals. Clear? Apart from Bhakti, there was similar kind of movement within the religion of Islam because by this time Islam came to India, Islam had arrived in India and with Islam a concept of connecting with God that is being tas having tasavvuf with God was developed in the form of Sufism or Sufi movement at this time. Clear? Initially Sufism developed in Central and West Asia but in course of time several Sufi saints came to India and they popularized Sufism in India that led to concept of being connected with God without formal worship. That was through music, that was through dance, which was a unique development within the religion of 
Islam. All these developments, cultural developments, took place in the early medieval phase. Apart from these development, apart from these developments, other cultural developments were that Sanskrit literature began to develop at this point of time. Sanskrit literature was largely promoted by Gurjara Pratihara's rulers in western part of India. Several Sanskrit works began to be compiled at this time, by, compiled at the time even by, by the rulers in eastern part of India. Tamil literature, apart from Sangam literature, there were certain bhakti saints who began to compose in Tamil and that resulted into compilation of a huge text known as Tevaram, which is even considered to be the fifth Veda after the four Vedic literature compiled in ancient India. Newly developing languages also began to develop at this time. Clear? The most and most prominent language that developed indigenously in India was the Kannad language. The Kannad language developed in the peninsular part of part of India, and the first major work was Kaviraj Mark, which was written at this time to promote the new language of Kannad. Later on, in this language of Kannad, several writers emerged to it began to merge that even resulted into establishment of a sect known as the Lingaya sect by Basav who is considered to be a great social reformer in the peninsular region of India. During the culture, during the early medieval phase from 750 to 1200 AD, his sense of history writing also began to develop. I'll let you know one thing that till this time, no prominent historical work of scientific character was compiled in Indian tradition. But for the first time, a very important writer emerged in the region of Kashmir in the northern part of India known as Kalhan. And Kalhan showed a strict sense of history writing through chronological order when he wrote the history of Kashmir, starting from the Stone Age till the reign of, till the reign of Akbar when Kashmir was finally conquered. And in this history, he has written about, elaborately about the developments in Kashmir in perfect chronological order, the work being termed as Raj Tarangini. In fact, Raj Tarangini of Kalan is considered to be the first scientific historical work of Indian tradition. Apart from this, a very prominent scholar came to India with the arrival of Turkish warriors in early medieval India known as Al-Biruni. And Al-Biruni was a very prominent scholar who moved across Indian territory and after moving across Indian territory, he was able to write a comprehensive work on India known as Kitab ul Hind or Book of India. In this work, he has dealt elaborately about the history, culture, tradition, geography of India and he has even mentioned about the role of Brahmins, he praised Brahmins for their knowledge and wisdom, but at the same time criticized them for their conservative approach. During the early medieval phase, another cultural development was growth of art and architecture. Clear? In the field of architecture, temples began to be constructed in large numbers, especially in the southern part of India. And by this time only, three different styles of temple architecture emerged in India. These styles of temple architecture are known as the Nagar style of temple architecture, the Vesar style of temple architecture and the Dravid style of temple architecture. The Vesar Nagar style of temple architecture with huge shikhar or top was followed in northern part of India. Dravid style was followed by followed in southern part of India and Vesar style was followed in the central part of India which was a mix of Nagar and Dravid style. Large number of temples began to be constructed in early medieval India mostly by the Cholas in the southern part of India that is the Brihadeshwar temple and other prominent temples in the extreme south. So artistic and cultural developments began to develop rapidly. The artistic, the greatest artistic development was Ajanta paintings achieved its culminating point during this phase which was started in ancient India largely marked by Buddhist depiction. Clear. Next was sculpture. Clear. The sculptural development also took place as several important cult sculptural art began to be manufactured at this time. In fact, there was a ruler named as Someshwara who wrote a very important work on sculpture, sculpture manufacturing known as Abhilasha Tirth Chintamani. All these developments became very prominent cultural traditions of early medieval India. Paintings also developed to a certain extent, but no major works of painting was found at this point of time because paintings was highly restricted because of because of non because of lack of patronage given by regional monarchs of India. Clear? Painting achieved its climax under the rule of the Mughals, which we'll discuss later on in medieval India. 
these were cultural traditions of early medieval India that is from 750 AD till 1200 AD. Now what major prominent questions has been asked, we will look into those questions as well from this topic. First is Shankara Charles philosophy and its impact, short nod. Shankara Charles philosophy as we discussed, Shankara Charles philosophy is known as the philosophy of Advaitvaad, clear? Which basically means monism or in English we also termed as non-dualism. Non-dualism. Monism, non-dualism means that there is only one thing. That is no difference between creator and the created beings. This philosophy was given by Shankaracharya and to realize that there is no difference between the creator and the created beings, he advocated the path of knowledge or Gyan Mark. But Shankaracharya could not leave a huge imprint on Indian, Indian society because his philosophy could not be comprehended by masses and therefore his role remained to be highly limited in nature. This was asked in 1987. And Kalhan as a historian, 2003, short notes were asked. Normally you get short notes from these topics. Kalhan was the first scientific historian of India who chronologically mentioned the history of Kashmir in his work, Raj Tarangani that we discussed right now. So these are few questions that has been asked from this topic. So these are two major topics related to early medieval India that is from 750 AD till 1200 AD. From 1200 AD, early medieval or medieval India starts in real sense as it was marked by establishment of Islamic rule that is Delhi Sultanate with huge consequences on polity, economy, society, religion, art and architecture. Clear? So we'll start with medieval India and first of all the syllabus is given century wise. We'll discuss about the 13th century. Clear? So first of all, we'll discuss about medieval India. First topic of medieval India, that is 13th century. Establishment of Delhi Sultanate, Ghorian invasions, factors behind Ghorian success, economic consequences, social consequences, cultural consequences, foundation of Delhi Sultanate, consolidation by Iltat Mishan, Balban. Now just understand, clear? That by the beginning of the 13th century, Several warriors from Central Asia started to arrive in India. Clear? One warrior who left a huge imprint on Indian society and tradition was Muhammad Ghuri of Central Asia. Clear? Muhammad Ghuri started to attack India if in fact by the end of 12th century only. Clear? His first major venture in India was in the year 1191 when he came to India and fought a battle against a prominent Rajput ruler Prithvi Raj Chauhan in the battlefield of Tarain in Delhi. Clear? So first encounter was in the battlefield of Tarain near Delhi in 1191. In this battle, Muhammad Ghuri got defeated by Prithvi Raj Chauhan and he had to return back to Central Asia. He replanned his strategy, again came to India in the next 1192, faced Muhammad Mithri Raj Chauhan in the same battlefield of Tarain and in the second encounter, he defeated Prithvi Raj Chauhan. Clear? After defeating Prithvi Raj Chauhan, Muhammad Ghuri again returned back to Central Asia, leaving the charge of India to his trusted slave named as Kutub Uddin Ayabak. Muhammad Ghuri again came back to India in 1194, defeated the defeated Jechen in the battlefield of Chandavar. And after defeating Chand battlefield in the battle of Chandavar, he led the strong foundation of Delhi Sultanate. So Ghurian invasions or invasions led by Muhammad Ghuri, known as Ghurian invasions, became a major factor for the establishment of Delhi Sultanate. How and why Muhammad Ghuri succeeded? against the indigenous rulers of Rajput rulers of India because Muhammad Ghuri was an efficient warrior, no doubt. He came with swift horses at this time, but at the same time, the major reason of defeat was Rajput rulers were not united in the struggle against Ghurians and their mutual dissensions and differences led to their defeat at, at the hands of Muhammad Ghuri that led to establishment of Delhi Sultanate. With the establishment of Delhi Sultanate, the first rule of Delhi Sultanate was Kutub Uddin Ayabak. He became independent after the death of his master Muhammad Ghuri in 1206. He led the base of Delhi Sultanate. After this only, economic changes, social changes began to take place. 
as they wanted to establish centralized control over India. Clear? Economic consequences, they wanted to promote agriculture through centralized control. Social changes because they wanted to introduce sense of equality as given by the principles of Islam. Culture consequences, they wanted to promote their own culture of Islam and at this time they began to promote artistic development, architectural developments in the form of worship, places of worship of Islamic faith. All these led to cultural consequences. Delhi Sultanate after being established by Kutubuddin Nabak was largely consolidated by Iltatmish and Palban. Clear? Iltatmish ruled in the beginning of first half of the 13th century. Iltatmish was able to promote Ikta system whereby agricultural lands were given to Ikta holders or officers of Delhi Sultanate as a transferable revenue assignment. Ikta system established by Iltatmish became the basis of economic and social system of Delhi Sultanate. After the death of Iltatmish, for a brief period of time, his daughter ruled over Delhi Sultanate, that is Razia. But Razia could rule only for three and a half years, could not leave much imprint on Delhi Sultanate. Next major ruler of Delhi Sultanate was Balban. Balban ruled in the second half of the 13th century as a strong monarch. Balban gave his own theory of kingship. This theory of kingship is known as divine origin of kingship, whereby Balban proclaimed that he was the shadow of God on earth and every person should give him due respect as is given to God. He started the concept of Sijda and Paibos, whereby all the persons were supposed to bow before him or touch or kiss his feet just to show that he was a supreme commander. With Balban only, era of strong centralized monarchy was established and Delhi Sultanate came on its firm footing in India. Balban was even able to stop Mongol invasions over India from the northwestern part of India, which was his major contribution. All these developments took place in the 13th century that led to the establishment and consolidation of Delhi Sultanate. After 13th century, Delhi Sultanate got further expanded and consolidated under the rule of the Khaljis and the Tughlaqs that we look into the next topic. First of all, like, what kind of question has been asked from this century that is the 13th century? Balban's theory of kingship, clear? Balban believed in the divine origin of kingship. He believed that none of the power person or nobles is where is equal. He treated them with huge amount of impurity and therefore Balban's theory of kingship became very unique. He introduced the concept of Sijda and Paibos just to show that he was next to God or rather the shadow of God on earth. The Battle of Tarain and Chandavar laid the foundation of Turkish rule in India. We had just discussed in the battles of Tarain, Prithvi Raj Chauhan was defeated that marked the end of effective Rajput assistance and in the battle of Chandavar in 1194, Jaichand was defeated that marked the end of Rajput resistance continue, con completely and that led to the establishment of a foundation of Turkish rule or the rule of Delhi Sultans in India. In 2018. Medieval India is quite straight. If you understand things properly, you won't face any problem. Clear? At the same time, after this, we will move to next century, it is the 14th century. In the 14th century, the first topic is the Khalji revolution, Alauddin Khalji, conquest and expansion, agrarian measures, economic measures, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, major projects and experiments. Now just understand, clear? The rule of Kutubuddin Ayabak, Iltatmish, Razia, Balban and thereafter, all these sultans of Delhi belonged to a dynasty, that dynasty is known as the slave dynasty. Clear? They were basically known as slave dynasty because all of them were slaves of their masters. They are also known as Mamluk dynasty in history. Clear? All these were terms used for these rulers. But after the end of slave dynasty, the next dynasty that came into existence in Delhi Sultanate was the Khalji dynasty. The Khalji dynasty was established by Jalaluddin Khalji. But the most prominent ruler of Khalji dynasty was Alauddin Khalji who ruled for two decades from 1296 till 1316. The arrival of Khaljis is considered to be a revolution by historian Professor Muhammad Habib. Now why revolution? Why this terminology has been used by Professor Muhammad Habib? Revolution is a term that indicates long-term changes of structural character. Now what were these changes introduced by Khalji rulers Jalaluddin Khalji that is termed as, that is termed as Khalji revolution. Jalaluddin Khalji was a secular monarch. 
and therefore he even though he followed islamic religion in his personal life but at the same time he showed huge amount of tolerance to other religions and that is why a concept of secularism got introduced into islamic empire that is delhi sultanate which was of tremendous implication at this time clear jalaluddin khalji not only was a liberal monarch jalaluddin khalji even wanted to introduce non turks into into delhi sultans or turkish nobility because till this time only turkish persons were introduced in the turkish nobility introduction of indian muslims also began to take place other persons also began to take place that made the turkish nobility or the sultan nobility to be a heterogeneous section this was also a very prominent change introduced by jalaluddin khalji and therefore professor muhammad habib has rightly termed it to be khalji revolution jalaluddin khalji was succeeded by Alauddin Khalji was considered to be the greatest monarch of not only Khalji dynasty but the entire Delhi Sultanate. Clear? Alauddin Khalji went for extensive territorial conquest and expansion. He conquered large areas, even the regions of Rajasthan, including the two important forts of. Ranthambore and Chittor, where Rajput women performed Johar just to save their honor while Rajput, Alauddin Khalji invaded those regions. Alauddin Khalji was able to conquer large parts of the region and in this ta task he was even assisted by slave that is Malik Kapoor. Alauddin Khalji is also remembered for agrarian measures. He introduced several innovative measures. He started the practice of agricultural land measurement. He started the policy of scientific assessment of agricultural produce and also started the concept of market regulations as well, where the prices of certain commodities were fixed. Clear? Under economic measures, his market mechanism became a wonder of the age because prices could not be fluctuated according to demand and supply. Rather, the prices were fixed from top and these concepts or this, this is known as market control mechanism of Alauddin Khalji. This market control mechanism of Alauddin Khalji became the wonder of medieval times and this market control mechanism of Alauddin Khalji enabled him to maintain large military force without enhancing their salary because those military force could get basic commodities without increase in prices or without any inflationary trend and with this he was able to create law maintain large military force without creating any burden on sultanate treasury and that enabled Alauddin Khalji to defend Delhi sultanate from six Mongol invasions that took place during the reign of Alauddin Khalji that is considered to be his greatest achievement in the entire medieval history. Apart from this, Alauddin Khalji was died in 1313-16, followed by weak rulers, and finally, Khalji dynasty was replaced by another Turkish dynasty in Delhi Sultanate known as the Tughlaq dynasty. The founder of Tughlaq dynasty was Gyasuddin Tughlaq, who could rule only for four years, and Gyasuddin Tughlaq was succeeded by his son and successor. Muhammad bin Tughlaq, who is considered to be a great personality of medieval times. Muhammad bin Tughlaq ruled from 1324 till 1351, and he is remembered in history as man of ideas and experiments. He undertook five experiments and projects during his reign, but unfortunately, all those experiments failed, and therefore he was even considered to be a transcendental failure. He introduced projects like token currency, transfer of capital, at the same time agrarian experiments, Khurasan expedition, Karachil expedition. We'll discuss all these in detail. And therefore, all since all these experiments failed, he became or his image got highly tarnished till he died in the year 1351. Muhammad bin Tughlaq was succeeded by Firoz Shah Tughlaq and Firoz Shah Tughlaq is considered to be an Islamic ruler of Delhi Sultanate. In order to check the decline and disintegration of Delhi Sultanate, Firoz Shah Tughlaq declared Ikta system to be hereditary in nature, which was till this time transferable revenue assignment. He did this in order to take the support of Ikta holders to check the decline of Delhi Sultanate. Firoz Shah Tughlaq even at the same time followed Islamic principles to take the support of religious leaders or ulemas of Islamic faith. All these policies were successful in short term, but in the long term, it became a major factor for disintegration and decline of Delhi Sultanate. These were major developments of 14th century. At the same time, Firoz Shah Tughlaq is remembered. Bureaucracy was established, that is nobility class. 
Close shop took like is remembered instead because of his agrarian measures. He established large number of orchards near Delhi, and stab while establishing orchards, he planted some hybrid varieties of grapes and other fruits in Delhi. He started the work of civil engineering and public works, whereby he constructed large number of dams in order to promote economic growth and development. Clear? All these succeeded in long short term. But in the long run, he could not check the decline and disintegration of Delhi Sultanate, and Delhi Sultanate started to decline and disintegrate. At the same time, the important information of Delhi Sultanate is provided by certain contemporary sources, but a very prominent foreign traveler, that is Ibn Battuta from Morocco, came to India. And Ibn Battuta, when he came to India, he wrote an important work, which is titled as Kitab ul Rahla, in which he has given detailed mentioning about Delhi Sultanate and even about some provincial kingdoms like. The Vijayanagar Kingdom at that time. So this source serves an important important source to reconstruct the history of Delhi Sultanate, which is mentioned specifically in our syllabus. This was developments in the 14th century. Now, what kind of questions are asked? What were the aims of Alauddin Khalji behind his market regulations? We had discussed, and how far were they achieved? Clear? They were achieved in to a large extent because he was able to check Mongol invasions effectively as six Mongol invasions took place during his reign. But in the long term, his market regulations could not be successful because as soon as he died, the whole market mechanism collapsed because it was not based on demand and supply, the scientific economic principle. It was based on force and surveillance. And certain that kind of force or surveillance exercised by Alauddin Khalji could not be exercised by his successors. So market control regulations whereby he fixed the prices of different commodities in different markets were successful till he was alive. But after his death, the whole mechanism collapsed immediately. Okay. Do you agree with the view that Muhammad bin Tughlaq was a transcendental failure? Why did he fail to achieve the ideals he had set for himself? As we discussed, Muhammad bin Tughlaq was a man of ideas and experiments. He undertook five important experiments during his reign. The first was transfer of capital from Delhi to Dolatabad. Dolatabad located in the region of Peninsular India. But people did not support this experiment and therefore this failed. So he was not basically a transcendental failure. Rather, people did not support him for this project. Muhammad bin Tughlaq went for token currency whereby silver coins were replaced by bronze coins because there was scarcity of silver all across the world in 14th century. The idea was not bad. But since duplicate coins began to be forced by his bureaucrats, by his officers, it led to the failure of this project. Okay. Next was his Khurasan expedition. He wanted to conquer the region of Khurasan in Central Asia, which was considered to be the homeland of the Turks. But he could not succeed because Central Asian rulers did not support this project. Karachi expedition because he wanted to defeat the tribes of Karachi region in the Kamau Hills of present Himalayan region. But Kumau, tribes of Kumau region, they, they followed the guerrilla strategy and defeated the Sultanate forces. And finally, he resorted to agrarian measures whereby he decided to collect 50% of the total producer's revenue, land revenue, which was not supported by the peasantry class. And this experiment also failed. So this, all these failed to achieve because the people the rulers did not support him. That is why a contemporary scholar, Bernie, commented when Muhammad bin Tughlaq died that people got relieved of Sultan and Sultan got relieved of his people because both got frustrated from each other because none of the progress of Muhammad bin Tughlaq succeeded and at the same time people suffered a lot due to these projects. These are few questions that has been asked from the topic that is the 14th century. Now we'll move on to another topic, another topic, this topic of the slavers, society, culture, and economy in the 13th and 14th century. So political history and the major developments were discussed. Now we'll discuss what social, cultural, and economic development took place in 13th and 14th centuries combined together. Composition of rural society and rural classes. The composition of rural society and classes remained almost intact. However, during 13th and 14th century, the ruling classes got altered because Islamic rulers came from Central Asia and they became to they began to rule over India. Ruling elites got different, and in among the ruling classes, the major role was played by the noble class, nobility class, that is the Turkish nobility class, and the ulema, who so were considered to be Islamic theologians. Town dwellers, town dwellers almost remain to be the same as people in before them also. They traded, they remained in cities, and certain cities further began to develop, especially cities like Delhi and adjoining areas, which was patronized by 
the sultans of delhi condition of women almost remained to be same women were supposed to stay within the four walls of the house the women also began to perform to follow the parda system whereby they kept themselves veiled completely in fact the condition of women got further deteriorated when alauddin khalji started resorted to whole scale plunder and women especially rajput performed johar to save their honor that all indicate condition of women remained to be deteriorated or pathetic even at this time religious classes obviously brahmans continued to exist among hindu society and islamic society ulemas started to dominate the religious classes in 13th and 14th century caste and slavery in hindu system caste continued to exist whereby the brahmans the kshatriyas the vaishyas and sudras began to be identified with different occupation that they began to follow slavery became institutional by this time because as we all know the first dynasty itself was the slave dynasty because by this time the turkish rulers followed the custom of maintaining large number of slaves in fact firoz shah tughlaq established a separate department for slaves that is diwan e bandagan and he it is said to have maintained 180000 slaves for himself that indicate institution of slavery became highly recognized by this time bhakti movement and sufi movement clear 13th and 14th century is very important for bhakti and sufi movement large number of bhakti leaders emerged at this time clear and this bhakti movement they started started to acquire huge amount of institutional character as well clear within bhakti movement large number of bhakti leaders they began to devote themselves in the world of towards the worship of lord vishnu and lord vishnu began to worship in the form of different avatars even lord krishna as well and since large since avatars of lord vishnu began to be devoted a worship by large number of bhakti bhakti leaders it resulted into a very important sect in india known as vaishnavism so vaishnavism is marked by devotion towards lord vishnu and its is a tarz and vaishnavism became a very prominent feature in 13th and 14th century in bhakti movement very important development took place as two prominent monotheistic saints emerged in northern part of india and these two prominent monotheistic saints of north india were kabir and nanak monotheistic means they wanted to worship only one single god and that too that god did not had any form like lord vishnu for nanak his god was nirankar which means without any akar without any form kabir called his god with the name of allah also rahim also ram also these two saints became very important saints and they uncompromisingly believed in the monotheistic practice of worshiping one single god without any rituals without any complexity is clear sufi movement by 13th and 14th century sufi movement also took its institutionalized character and the most important sufi sect that emerged in india was the chisti sect this sect was established by a very prominent chisti saint named as was a moinuddin chisti he came to delhi first of all from central asia but later on got settled in the region of ajmer in rajasthan where he died in 1236 and since then ajmer has emerged to be a very prominent pilgrimage center to mark the pilgrimage to mark the tomb of khwaja moinuddin chisti and khwaja moinuddin chisti were followed by other important chisti saints like qutbuddin bakhtiyar kaki then followed by other saints like nizamuddin auliya all these resulted into prominent development of sufi and bhakti movement in 13th and 14th century with the arrival of turks persian language came to india and persian began to be promoted at this time in fact persian became the court language of delhi sultan the most prominent persian writer of sultanate period was amir khusro who was the court poet of alauddin khalji amir khusro wrote different works and masnavis at this time and all these works are considered to be masterpieces of persian language and literature in fact amir khusro is remembered not only of copying persia from iranian content he used indian words also in persian language and established a hybrid form known as the language of india or at the same time the language of this country or hind therefore he is considered to be a very prominent indian writer of persian language and literature regional languages also developed in northern part of india by this time the most prominent regional language being hindi language clear hindi language developed in that in early medieval phase and developed prominently during 13th and 14th century the first prominent hindi writer being chandrabardai who wrote a work known as 
Prithvi Raj Raso, in which he has glorified his master Prithvi Raj Chauhan, the ruler of Ajmer. All these resulted into cultural developments in 13th and 14th century. Clear? Clear. Literature in the languages of southern India and south India also, we have discussed that Kannad developed in early medieval India. During 13th and 14th century, other languages also began to develop, apart to develop. Tamil acquired huge amount of importance at this time. Kannad and Tamil became very prominent languages in the regions of southern India. Sultanate architecture. The Delhi Sultans began to promote large number of monuments as well. Initially, they converted the existing monuments and gave Islamic orientation by placing dome over the whole structure for formal worship. At the same time, Khalji rulers contributed significantly towards construction of new monuments. Alauddin Khalji built a new city known as Siri, where he constructed a Jama Masjid and other prominent monuments. Tughlaqs gave strength to the monuments and Tughlaqs constructed huge amount of cities including the city of Tughlaqabad, which was constructed by Gyasuddin Tughlaq, where he constructed his own tomb at the same time a fort also in the remains or in the suburbs of Delhi. So, Sultanate architecture continued to develop rapidly and became a prominent cultural development of 13th and 14th century. Paintings started in a rudimentary form, but paintings, since it is not according to the principles of Islam, would, was not patronized by Islamic rulers. So, we do not have much information about growth and development of paintings. Composite culture was reflected by Amir Khusro, whereby as we discussed that, he developed a new version of Persian language known as language of India or the word of Hind. Clear? Amir Khusro wrote several works whereby he has praised India in his different works, especially New Sefir or Nine Skies, whereby he showed his patriotism towards India. Economy. Economy was largely based on agriculture growth and development. Agriculture production whereby wheat and other rice, other food grains were cultivated. Based on surplus agriculture produced only, produce only, urban economy began to develop and external trade also began to be patronized and promoted by Sultans of Delhi. Internal and external trade and commerce began to exist, especially with Central Asia that led to economic development during the entire phase of Delhi Sultanate, especially in 13th and 14th centuries. Clear? These were major developments. Now, we will look into some few questions which has been asked from society, culture, economy in the 13th and 14th century. Indo-Islamic architecture during Khalji and Tughlaq period. Clear? So, why we do the use the word Indo-Islamic culture? Because the existing architectural features of India were mixed with Islamic features like this. The dome construction, the minaret construction that result into hybrid architecture known as Indo-Islamic architecture. And Indo-Islamic architecture during Khalji and Tughlaq period, during the reign of Khalji, Alauddin Khalji established a new city, Siri, constructed a Jama Masjid. At the same time, he also used red sandstone elaborately. With this red sandstone, he constructed several important monuments in India. At the same time, Tughlaqs also contributed significantly. Gyasuddin Tughlaq established the city of Tughlaqabad. Muhammad bin Tughlaq established the city of Jahapana. And Firoz Shah Tughlaq laid the basis of several cities like Firozabad or Hisar Firoza in modern Haryana and Firozabad that is located in modern Uttar Pradesh. And in these cities, large number of monuments were constructed that is forts and mosques in order to show the hybrid form of architecture known as Indo-Islamic architecture. This was this is one typical question which is asked basically from this topic. This was society, culture, and economy. Now move on to the next topic of medieval India that is the 15th and the 16th century clear now why why 15th and 16th century is mentioned together and what is important clear delhi sultanate declined and disintegrated by 15th century and after the decline and disintegration of delhi sultanate on the remains of last sultanate several regional kingdoms began to emerge regional kingdoms like bengal kashmir gujarat malwa Bahmanids and the Lodi is clear. Kashmir is very important. The reason being that Kashmir began to be ruled by a very progressive ruler in the 15th century from 1420 to 17, known as Zainul Abidin. Clear. This Kashmir, you often get questions on Kashmir. Clear. Kashmir came to be ruled by a ruler who was very progressive in nature, known as Zainul Abidin. 
this ruler zainul abidin he translated large number of sanskrit works into persian to understand sanskrit culture and tradition zainul abidin constructed large number of monuments especially on ruler lakes in kashmir zainul abidin prevented cow slaughter zainul abidin protected the lives of hindus in the region of kashmir and therefore zainul abidin because of his tolerant attitude is also known as akbar of kashmir clear at the same time other two prominent regional kingdoms of provincial dynasties in 15th 16th centuries were the bahmanids and the vijayanagar especially vijayanagar clear the bahmanids and vijayanagar were in the southern part of india they fought against each other to gain mastery over tunga badra dwap region the region which was also a contested region between pallavas and chalukyas in ancient india but apart from political conflict vijayanagar dynasty is important for cause of its one progressive ruler that is krishna dev raya who contributed significantly towards political control krishna dev raya also contributed towards artistic development literary development and even architecture as well we'll discuss about these developments later on because culture is mentioned in another topic clear then at the same time there was another dynasty that is lodis who came after tughlaqs lodis ruled only for a brief period of time and during the lodis only sultanate completely declined and disintegrated that led to the establishment of these provincial kingdoms clear at the same time apart from these kingdoms i let you know that during 15th and 16th century only after the provincial kingdoms mughal empire was established by babur then followed by san humayu but that's an in between huma between sur empire was established by sher shah suri very prominent ruler again i let you know clear that after the decline and disintegration of delhi sultanate Babur came to India and Babur defeated the last Lodi ruler Pahlo Lodi in the battlefield of Panipat in 1526. Babur from Central Asia led the basis of Mughal Empire and Mughal Empire. Why it is not considered under Delhi Sultanate? Because Babur did not establish his capital at Delhi. Clear? Babur established his capital at Agra, which is presently located in Uttar Pradesh. Babur could rule only for four years, and Babur was succeeded by his son Humayu. Humayu could rule only for ten years, and Humayu was defeated by an Afghan warrior, Sher Shah Suri. And after defeating Humayu, Sher Shah Suri forced Humayu to go back to Persia or Iran, and Sher Shah Suri established an Afghan empire in India known as. Sur Empire that existed for 15 years. Sher Shah is remembered in history because Sher Shah was a very prominent ruler who ruled over large parts of India, gave patronage to literary personalities also, and at the same time constructed very important monuments. His own tomb in the middle of a lake known as Lake of Sher Shah Suri or Tomb of Sher Shah Suri at Sasaram in Bihar. Clear. At the same time, clear Portuguese colonial enterprise started to arrive because by this time Portuguese came to India along the western coast and they began to dominate the western coast, especially in the region of Gujarat. By this time, later on we'll see Portuguese were followed by the Dutch, the British, and even by the French. Clear. This was the first phase of Mughal Empire at the time. Clear. Bhakti and Sufi movement. Bhakti and Sufi movement continued even during this phase. marked by important important leaders including nanak and kabir as well now what are the questions asked from this topic do you think that the reign of krishna dev raya inaugurated a new epoch in the history of vijayanagar yes krishna dev raya was the most prominent ruler among the vijayanagar he defeated the bahmanids he defeated the other country rulers and vijayanagar and krishna dev raya contributed significantly towards growth and development of literary development literary development he himself was a great telugu writer who wrote the first major work in telugu known as amukta malayada so one new language was added in the region of south india that is telugu apart from tamil and kannada it became a very important development during the reign of krishna dev raya he constructed large number of temples as well like hazara rama swami temple vithal swami temple and therefore during his reign it is said that it inaugurated a new epoch in the history of vijayanagar krishna dev raya bring out the significance of the reign of sher shah in the history of india sher shah established sur empire for 15 years sher shah was an able administrator who established control over large parts of india sher shah contributed towards architecture by constructing his own tomb sher shah was able to promote literary personalities he promoted even hindi language during his court at this time clear all these developments resulted into huge contribution significance of the reign of sher shah 
in Indian history. Okay. This was 15th and 16th century. Now we'll move on to next topic that is the 15th and early 16th century society and culture. Regional cultural features. In regional cultural features, we have to discuss about cultural developments in Bengal, Vijayanagar, we had discussed, and other important rulers like Gujarat and all, where important forts were established. Literary developments, because by this time, new languages like Telugu was added by Krishna Devra. Hindi language was promoted further at this time, and in Hindi language was patronized even by Sesha Suri. Provincial architecture, new monuments were constructed in different provinces, as we had discussed. Zainul Abdin constructed new monuments in Kashmir. Gujarat was marked by several monuments at this time at Champanair and at the same time other important areas Malwa also other regions like the regions of the regions of Malwa and Mandu whereby monuments like Jahaz Mahal were constructed. Society, culture, and literature, art in Vijayanagar Empire largely promoted by Krishna Dev Raya. This was culture 15th and early 16th century society and culture. We we'll look into question also. Discuss how the Vijayanagar Empire became the cultural capital of the south. We discuss all the contributions of Krishna Devaraya, very important dynasty, and therefore, just because of those contributions, which are negative, must be the cultural capital of southern part of India. Next major topic is Akbar. Just understand briefly. As we had discussed, that Humayu was defeated by Sesha Suri, went to Persia, and while he was going to Persia or Iran, on his way, only a son was born to him in 1542, who later became the greatest monarch of medieval India, Akbar. Humayu returned back to India after 15 years, defeated the Su rulers, re-established Mughal Empire in 1555. But just after a few months only in 1556, Humayu died by falling from the stairs of his personal library, Sher Mandal at Delhi. And thereafter only, his wife constructed a beautiful tomb of Humayu, which is known as Humayu's tomb in Delhi, that can be witnessed even now. Clear? Humayu was succeeded by his son Akbar, and Akbar began to rule from 1556, he ruled till 1605, that is almost for half century. Clear? Akbar is remembered for his systematic policy of conquest and consolidation. He extended Mughal Empire in all directions from his capital city of Agra and he must to be the greatest political authority in the 16th century. Akbar, in order to consolidate his political gains, he even established two prominent systems known as the Mansab and Jagir system. As per Jagir system, agricultural lands were given to Jagirdars and these Jagirdars were considered to be backbone of Mughal Empire. At the same time, military rule generals of Mughal Empire were given Mansab or the title and designation and according to title and designation, salaries were fixed according to the role and this Mansab and Jagir system became the backbone of Mughal administration. Akbar was even able to consolidate his political gains because of his liberal outlook towards Rajputs. In fact, initially he was born and he was brought up under the control of Rajputs and developed a very liberal atmosphere and liberal mentality. He maintained healthy relationship with Rajputs, entered into matrimonial alliances with leading Rajput families in order to cement the ties and Rajput warriors enabled Akbar to consolidate his political gains in different parts of India. He especially like Raj, Raja Man Singh and at the same time Raja Bharamal as well. Apart from this, Akbar's religious and social outlook was highly liberal in nature. He abolished jazia, which was a discriminatory tax collected from non-Muslims since the establishment of Turkish rule. At the same time, he established Ibadat Khana to know about the different religions. He gave the principle of Sulekol, that is peace among all religions, that resulted into religious harmony during his reign. Apart from this, he gave patronage to art and technology as well. Art and technology, especially the art of painting was patronized by Akbar. And technology, he gave patronage to different scientific personalities to promote technology, especially glass technology. And very prominent person, Fatullah Shirazi, was given huge support by Akbar to promote technological developments in Mughal Empire. This were major developments in the reign of Akbar. Clear? Now, what prominent questions are asked from Akbar in medieval industry? Akbar was unique for his religio-political ideas and policies. Akbar was unique for his religio-political ideas. Why? Religio means he was highly liberal unlike other Islamic rulers of ancient India, in medieval India. He abolished jazia, he abolished pilgrimage tax. At the same time, he even, he even introduced, uh, restricted forceful restrictions or conversions to Islam. Political ideas because he followed a very systematic policy of political expansion with the support of Rajputs. Just because of this, he is considered to be unique for his religious and political ideas. 
Do you think that Akbar's Rajput policy was a conscious attempt to incorporate the Indian ruling elite within the Mughal Empire imperial system? Of course, it was a conscious policy and attempt of Akbar to introduce the most important warriors of India and the Mughals, that is the Rajput warriors, because he knew that with the support of Rajputs, it would become very easy for him to conquer other parts of India. And this became a reality as Akbar was able to conquer large parts of Indian territory with the help of Rajput warriors or Rajput families. These developments are related to the greatest monarch that is Akbar. Now we'll move on to the next topic that is Mughal Empire in the 17th century after the death of Akbar. Akbar was succeeded by his son Jahangir in 1605. Jahangir in turn was succeeded by his son Shah Jahan in 1627. Shah Jahan in turn was succeeded by his Aurangzeb in the year 1658. And Aurangzeb again ruled for 50 years from 1658 till 1707. And during his reign only, Mughal Empire started to decline and disintegrate. As far as administrative policies are concerned, Jahangir, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb followed the administrative policies of Akbar with slight changes. For instance, in Mansab Dari system, Jahangir introduced the concept of do Ashpa or see Ashpa, that is maintaining additional horses and troops, which was the requirement of the time. Okay? At the same time, with respect to religious policies, changes were introduced because none of these rulers was as liberal as Akbar. At the same, orthodoxy began to increase from Jahangir, Shah Jahan and Aurangzeb. And this became a distinct deviation from Akbar's religious policies. All these rulers maintained healthy relationship with Zamindars who were landed elite classes to maintain their hold over local people. Nature of Mughal state. Nature of Mughal state, there's different theories among scholars, in, among scholars including Jaduna Sarkar, Professor Habib and other scholars whereby it said Mughal state was highly a paternalistic state. Some scholars believe it was a highly centralized state. Some scholars believe that it was basically marked by elite classes or elite domination. These were the basic features of the nature of Mughal state. Crisis and revolt. Crisis in Mughal Empire started largely during the reign of Shah Jahan, when the prominent revolt began to take place in southern part of India by Malik Ambar. But real crisis started during the reign of Aurangzeb at this time. Clear? During the reign of Aurangzeb, Rajputs began to revolt against Mughal Empire. During the reign of Aurangzeb, very prominent ruler started revolt in the reign of Deccan, that is Shivaji, who established Maratha kingdom. During the reign of Aurangzeb, Sikhs began to revolt against Mughal Empire. During the reign of Aurangzeb, the warrior class of Assam began to revolt known as Ahom, so established Ahom kingdom in northeastern part of India. All these cries and revolts gave huge blow to Mughal Empire and Mughal Empire started to decline and disintegrate. Clear? These were developments in the 17th century. Now, we'll look into questions asked from this topic. Trace the development of Maratha power in the Shivaji. Clear? See, Shivaji was a very prominent Maratha warrior who followed the guerrilla strategy of warfare, whereby he never faced his enemy in an open field. Rather, he attacked his enemy in surprise. Clear? Shiva ji established control over the region of Marathwada, that is the region of Deccan and the region of Konkan. Clear? He was the ruler who began to face the adversity of Aurangzeb. He was the person who established Maratha kingdom with efficient administration and he ruled from 1627 till 1680 and therefore he is considered to be a very prominent warrior of medieval times. A Spanish also ruined Napoleon Bonaparte, the Deccan also ruined Aurangzeb. It is also related to Shivaji only because since Shivaji was to be the greatest enemy of Aurangzeb, Aurangzeb devoted huge energy and time to the region of Deccan to contain Shivaji as Napoleon gave emphasis to Spain, Spain that became a disease for Napoleon, became a reason for his decline. Huge amount of attention and huge amount of energy that was consumed or consumed in the region of Deccan just because Aurangzeb gave due emphasis there, it became a major factor for decline of Mughal Empire as it became also the reason for defeat of Napoleon because of his focus on Spain. Two events has been correlated to show that how these major developments took place in the world history as well as in medieval India. These are the questions asked from Mughal Empire in the 17th century. Now move on to another topic that is economy and society in the 16th and 17th century. Population, agriculture production and so on. Clear? There are different debates regarding the population of Mughal Empire. The research has been constructed by scholars like 
Shirin Musvi and other important scholars, and they say that population was highly, highly was large in number because there was no depth of agriculture produced, and economy was highly developed into the Mughals. Diverse agriculture production took place, including wheat, barley, and other food grains that enabled multiplication of population and at the same time economic development. Craft production, craft production indicated glass production at this time, paper making at this time, even bangles making at this time, and therefore diverse craft production took place under the patronage of the Mughal emperors. By this time, commerce started with Europe through Dutch, English, and French companies. By this time, Portuguese, apart from Portuguese, the Dutch came to India, the English came to India, the French companies came to India, and they began to trade with India with the permission of the Mughal emperors at this time, like Orange Mercantile classes also developed in India. Indian also began to trade with these people effectively. Large number of mercantile classes like Banjaras began to emerge at this time. Banking system started to take place in a rudimentary fashion as money began to be lended for trading and business purposes. Insurance was also provided to large, to large scale or long distance trade as people, goods used to travel from one place to another system. Credit system began to develop which was a unique system in the 16th and 17th century. Clear. And in this credit system, I'll let you know a very prominent credit system that developed at this time was known as the Hundi system. Research on this has been conducted largely by Professor Rifan Habib. According to Hundi system, it was a bill or paper of credit whereby person after paying huge amount of money took a letter and wherever he wanted to go to purchase items he went with that letter took the cash at that place purchased the items so there was no need to carry cash with him, cash in hand just to protect his amount and this hundi system became a very important credit system during 16th and 17th century condition of peasants remains almost similar the peasants were under exploitation as they had to produce huge amount and pay regular revenue to the state condition of women also remained to be almost similar as women were follow, for, strictly for, follow asked to follow the parda system and even the institution of johar or sati was continued to exist continue to exist in 16th and 17th century by this time a new community came into existence known as sikh community and the khalsa pan clear sikh community came into existence on the basis of the teachings of 10 spiritual gurus starting with guru nanak and ending with Guru Gobind Singh, clear. One thing must be understood, Guru Nanak never advocated the establishment of new religion. But the followers of 10 Gurus, they established a new religion known as Sikh religion after the death of 10th Guru, that is Guru Gobind Singh in 1708. But since Sikhs began to face adversity from Mughal emperors, especially Aurangzeb, they established a military unit known as the Khalsa Panth. And this Khalsa Panth began to fight against the Mughal emperors and Mughal military generals, which became an important feature and crisis of 17th century medieval history. These developments took place. Now we look into question that is that has been asked from this topic. What, which were the major European powers engaged in trade with India in the medieval period? How did they organize their trade? And what were the chief items of trade? Major European powers were the Portuguese, the Dutch, the English, and the French with in medieval India. How did they organize their trade? They organized their trade through force also. They organized their trade through on equality basis as well. Portuguese applied huge amount of force to establish themselves. Dutch, English and French applied both force as well as diplomacy to carry on trade with Indian traders. And what were the chief items of trade? They brought bullions from the side that is gold and silver and they took important items like cotton products from India, silk products from India, important basically important items like spices from southern part of India, ivories from India and all these were very important items of trade between European companies and Indian mercantile classes. Clear. Now we'll move on to the next important topic that is culture in the Mughal Empire. Clear. Within culture, first of all, we'll discuss about growth and development of Persian language. Persian was the court language of the Mughals as was the case with the Delhi Sultans. And in Persian language, large number of scholars emerged. The most prominent scholar of Persian language who emerged during the Mughal period, this person was Abul Fazl. Clear. He was in the court of Akbar and Abul Fazl wrote very important work that is Akbar Nama. The third part of Akbar Nama is titled as Aini Akbari. Apart from Abul Fazl, there were other important Persian writers as Persian was largely patronized by 
Mughal emperors. Hindi literature also developed at this time and during 16th and 17th century, Hindi literature was promoted by a large number of literary experts, the most prominent being the person that is known as Tulsi Das, who wrote an important work in Avdi dialect of Hindi termed as Ram Charit Manas. There were other prominent Hindi writers also, Malik Muhammad Jaisi, who wrote Padmavat at this time, who was patronized by Seisha Suri. Mughal architecture, Mughals are remembered history for constructing large monuments. Clear? Babur constructed his tomb at tomb, a tomb in tomb in Kabul, and Babur even constructed some mosques like mosque at Panipat and Ayodhya. Babur at the same time, Panipat and Sambal, a mosque at Ayodhya was constructed by his military general Mir Baki. After Babur, Humayu also constructed several monuments, the most prominent being Humayu's tomb, which was constructed after his death by his wife at Delhi. Akbar constructed large number of monuments like Diwan-e-Aam, diwan e khas panch Mahal, Jodha Bais Palace and all these were constructed in the newly developed city of Akbar known as Fatehpur Sikri near Agra. Jahangir also constructed monuments but Mughal architecture reached zenith under Shah Jahan who constructed a new city in Delhi known as Shah Jahanabad where he led the basis of Jama Masjid and the most important monument constructed by Shah Jahan was the Taj Mahal at Agra, which was basically the grave or the tomb of his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. Okay. Mughal architecture began to decline after Aurangzeb and this became an important feature of culture. Mughal painting also became a very important development in culture. Mughal painting was largely started during the reign of Humayu. When he returned from Iran or Persia, he brought some Iranian painters and started to patronize this art of painting, which was further supported by Akbar. But painting reaches Zenith under the reign of Jahangir, who was a keen naturalist who identified several paintings and at the same time used multiple colors to show different images as well. Even to, in the field of painting, European influences could be seen during the reign of Jahangir as British and Europeans, other Europeans contributed towards paintings in India. Provincial architects also developed at different provincial level, especially during the reign of Mughals. Rajput promoted more provincial architecture in the region of Rajasthan. Provincial paintings were also promoted by Rajputs in different schools like the Bundi school, the Kishangal school in Rajasthan. Classical music also developed because Mughal emperors promoted music. In fact, there was a royal band that operated in the Mughal court. Mughal music was largely promoted by Akbar and even by Shah Jahan to a large extent and science and technology. Mughals could not promote science and technology effectively. There were only some rulers like Bug who gave patronage to Fatullah Shirazi. Since science and technology was not lightly patronized, major developments in science and technology could not take place. But there were certain works like paper making, the art of paper making, even the field of painting, matchlock industry, gun industry, and glass industry, where certain amount of scientific progress took place apart from technological growth. These were major cultural developments in the Mughal Empire. Okay. Now we will move on to see a question that is asked from the culture part. During the reign of Jahangir, Mughal painting reached Zenith. We are discussed right now because Jahangir was a keen naturalist. He totally supported the art of painting. He promoted portrait painting. He promoted miniature painting. At the same time, Jahangir introduced European influences in painting. He basically advocated the natural scenes to be depicted. Multiple colors began to be introduced. All this resulted into zenith of Mughal painting under Jahangir. The zenith of Mughal architecture was under Shah Jahan. As we had discussed, Mughals constructed large number of monuments, but the zenith was used under Shah Jahan who constructed several monuments, including the Grand Jama Masjid in Delhi, the city of Shah Jahanabad, Moti Masjid at Agra, and at the same time, the most important being the Taj Mahal at Agra. So, Mughal architecture and the Shah Jahan reads climax or Zen culture. Now, we will move on to the last topic of Mughal of medieval India, that is 18th century, decline of Mughal Empire. There are different theories related to the decline of Mughal Empire given by scholars. The most important theory being given by Professor Muhammad Habib that it was a centralized system which could not be controlled to a large extent under different monarchs and started to crumble under its own weight. Well, Professor Rifan Habib has also highlighted agrarian crisis as a major factor for the decline of Mughal Empire. We can discuss all the theories in course of time in classes to understand what major factors led, 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 led to decline of Mughal Empire. But on the remains of Mughal Empire, when it began to decline and disintegrate, several regions came into existence like Dakkan, where the province of Hyderabad was established, then Kingdom of Bengal, where Murshid Kalikuli Khan began to rule, then Awadh, 
then marathas and the shivaji and followed by peshwas and at the same time emergence of afghan power so these regional kingdoms came into being on the debris of mughal empire and therefore it became a very important feature of 18th century afghan power also emerged in the 18th century and during 18th century only afghan warrior nadir shah invaded india in 1739 took away the peacock throne of shah jahan and the and the kohinoor diamond and this afghan power began to rise rapidly in india and this afghan power resulted into a major crash in india in the 18th century in the form of the third battle of panipat between the marathas and the afghans and in this third battle afghans defeated the marathas it became a major blow to the major blow to the marathas in the battlefield of panipat and that resulted into huge vacuum and this vacuum facilitated the british to establish control over india in the 18th and 19th century all these conditions existed on the eve of the british conquest that resulted into establishment of british rule over india in modern history we'll discuss the syllabus of modern indian history in our next session clear i hope all the topics has been discussed thoroughly prominent questions has also been discussed and apart from this syllabus all the topics will be covered elaborately in our classes of history optional which will be taken by me thank you and enjoy yourself